Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the second What Matters to Me fall for this uh, talk for this fall. For those of you who came to the What Matters last month, thanks for coming back. For those who are new to the series, the idea is to take a break from our normal day-to-day -day work and come together as students, staff, community members, and hear what's important and what matters to our campus community, and hopefully establish a framework for some civil discourse where we can discover things that are meaningful, that matter, and we can really share how we want to interact around those items. We have some fantastic speakers that are willing to put forward what matters to them. And today we have three speakers with us. Carrie Mitchell is an English faculty member. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hi. Instructional coach and online lead. And the title for your presentation is Helping Students Become Learners. Carrie Mitchell is an English faculty at FRCC and has taught cos competition, not cosmetology. I do not, I do not no, but you could teach cosmetology. Cos okay. And I definitely don't teach competition. And not competition no, either. No. But it's composition courses for 12 years. <laughs> Prior to that, she was a teacher in the English department at CSU, where she mentor, mentored graduate teaching assistants. She says, despite more than 20 years of teaching and mentoring experience, I feel like I am only just learning what it takes to be a truly impactful teacher. Three years ago, Carrie and her colleague, Eric Salaha, hi Eric, <laughs> received a grant to research active learning and to develop the Active Learning Institute. The institute is currently in its fourth semester and has resulted in the redesign of over 20 courses. Carrie is also the instructional coach at FRCC Larimer, a position she shares with Eric, when away from teaching, Carrie is busy devising faster ways to get across Fort Collins. We'll need to talk some more about that. <laughs> Since most of her time is spent driving her two daughters to various activities. We've actually got daughters that have shared yep, some activities. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes, if she's lucky, she finds the time to read a good book, go for a run, or attend a Zumba class. Oh, yeah. Yes! <laughs> Zumba. I wish I was talking about Zumba today, but I'm not. We can schedule that for yeah, next, yeah. next cycle. Sounds good. Andrea, you heard that? She's on for Zumba. Jeb? Jeb Hartman is going to talk to us about waking up. Does that sound right? That's the title, yeah. That's the title. <laughs> we'll, see what he talks about. we'll see what he actually talks about. That's right. Jeb was born and raised in Fort Collins. He worked at Woodward for five years doing mechanical assembly. After a long process of reflection, he woke up to the fact he was on a path that was unsatisfying. He dropped everything and spent six months on an isolated biological research base in Costa Rica doing field work. After returning, he decided to pursue a degree in wildlife biology. He's currently doing a work study at the Rocky Mountain Raptor Program. I visited a couple weeks ago. We had an open house. It was awesome. Huge birds. Where he completed an internship in 2016 and has been there for about two years now. So we'll hear from Jeb also today. And Katie, um, this is not about cosmetology. It is. It is about cosmetology? Well, right. The talk is not. Okay. <laughs> Why sometimes your harder choice is your better choice. Kitty Wilson was born in South Plainfield, New Jersey. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was born in New York, so I got that. <laughs> and she grew up in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and lived in Philadelphia for five years before moving to Fort Collins in 2012. Over the summer, Kitty got her CNA certificate from Front Range, congratulations, and she's now pursuing her RN license and will eventually obtain a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And maybe a Master's later. Maybe, okay, no pushing, a little bit. She's not in any extracurricular activities, but she did make the Dean's List, again, congratulations, over the summer, and she works full time. Something relevant to her talk is that she has had her cosmetology license for 13 years. I would have thought you weren't that old yet, but in the little spare time, she was, she was two. She was two when she got She still likes to use her cosmetology skills on friends. I actually need a haircut, you can tell. And it turns out she is a great wedding planner. <laughs> I'm not getting married, but I can play married. Kara will speak first, then we'll have an awkward pause while we change microphones. Uh, this is a good time to get up, get more snacks, talk with your neighbors, and fill out feedback cards on the program at any time throughout. Um, after our final speaker, we'll open up for questions and answers and dialogue. Um, so help me welcome our first speech speaker or speecher. Carrie Mitchell. Hi. 
Hi, so um, the title of my talk is called Helping Students Become Learners. And I'm starting with a picture of a student. He's got everything he needs to be a student. He's got his backpack, he's got his laptop. Uh, I imagine this is the first day of class because he's smiling really broadly. <laughs> so I'm thinking he's eager, he's feeling like this is gonna be a good semester, I'm gonna get all A's, I'm gonna learn a lot. But now that we're in week seven, I'm starting to think that this is probably more uh, the demeanor that most of our students are assuming. And so they're still showing up, hopefully. Um, they've got their books and their pens and their papers, their coffee, they're playing the role of student, but maybe a little less enthusiasm than they bring with them on that first day of class. And unfortunately, this kind of blank stare look that we see in our classrooms quite often doesn't start in college. Uh, it settles in a lot earlier. So this is um, a photo of some middle schoolers during career day presentations. I imagine that the teacher thought this would be really exciting to bring people in from the community to talk about their careers. Um, but this little guy, he's sound asleep. And these two are sort of on the cusp of falling asleep. And these four guys in the middle, their eyes are open, but they really don't look very interested or engaged. And unfortunately, it saddens me to say, I think it starts even earlier. So here's some pictures of what I imagine to be fourth graders. And I selected fourth graders because I have a fourth grader, I have a nine-year-old, and she said a couple of things to me when school started that I wanna share with you. The first was this. Mom, school is really hard this year because Mrs. Blank won't let us put our heads down on our desk and that's all we wanna do. <laughs> so she was super bummed out that her teacher wouldn't let them take naps during class and she thought that was really unfair. And I was super bummed out because I thought, you're in fourth grade. You should still be interested in learning, right? And so I know they're learning um, Colorado Native American history, which is totally fascinating. So why does she want to put her head down and go to sleep? And then she said this, mom, fourth grade is when school stops being fun or interesting because um, we don't do things anymore. We just listen to the teacher talk. I thought that was really interesting. So it's all caused me to wonder, does it have to be this way? I don't think it does. So here are a couple of other pictures. Um, this is a photograph of kids I imagine to be in um, elementary school. And they look really excited about their learning. They're working hard, they're working collaboratively. I imagine their teacher gave them some kind of shared project. Maybe they're doing a collaborative, um, solving a problem collaboratively, but they're invested. They don't have those blank face stares. And here are some learners as well. These kids are on a soccer field, they're not in the classroom, but they're learning a whole lot. They're figuring out how to manipulate, um, how to use their bodies, uh, what the rules of soccer are. They're learning how to interact with team members, what the rules of the game are. And the reason I put these two photos on the same slide is because learning is learning no matter where it happens. And so whether you're learning to change the tire of a car, or you're learning to bake, or you're learning to play the piano, or you're learning to work physics problems. Our brain needs the same set of conditions to learn regardless of where that learning is happening. Here's some more engaged learning happening. These are um, my colleagues, Front Range faculty. They're engaged in learning during the Active Learning Institute. This is an institute that my colleague Eric Salahab and I started a few semesters ago. And during this session, they had been asked to come having read chapter four from this book called Small Teaching. And it would have been really easy for me and for Eric to stand in front of this group and to tell them what all the key points were and to highlight the main messages from chapter four and give them the notes and the takeaway. But we know that they would just look at us with those glazed over faces and we wanted them to engage. So we created some activities for them to connect with the material. And what I love about these two pictures is that these are colleagues who are working across the discipline. So these two guys are automotive faculty. We have philosophy, business faculty, um, some math faculty, political science. And so they're bringing all of their background specific expertise about their subjects to the table and then they're getting to combine that into new and exciting ideas. Whoops. Okay. So I would ask you what's the biggest difference between the learners and the non-learners? Is it the case that these kids just happen to be super intrinsically motivated? They just really want to learn and these people over here not so much? Um, I don't think that's true. I think the answer is simply this. The learners have been given something to do, a concrete task, uh, and they're likely being held account about, accountable for it in some significant way. 
I'm willing to bet that if these students over here were given a meaningful concrete task, they would look a lot more like those students. This is Benjamin Bloom. He's a brilliant educational psychologist and researcher. Um, some of you may be familiar with his uh, taxonomy of higher order thinking skills. It's something that if you have a, the background of an educator, you would have studied. Um, and we, even though this was developed in the 1950s, we still rely pretty heavily on this taxonomy today and to inform our practice. I'm not going to focus on his taxonomy today. Instead, I want to focus on a study that he conducted in 1953 out of the University of Chicago. And he looked at five large lecture courses with at least 150 students in each one. And the <clears throat> center piece or the focal point for his research was this. What kinds of thinking are students engaged in <clears throat> during lectures? What's actually happening in their minds? I think that's a fascinating question. So I put the question to you. How much time do you think, percentage-wise, Students are engaged in real thinking during lectures. And what I mean by real thinking is this. They are making inferences, drawing connections, applying ideas, formulating questions, all of that kind of great higher order thinking stuff that we really value in academia. 80%, 50%, yeah. 10%. Anyone else want to try a throw out? 5%, 30%. So what Bloom's research shows is that students are engaged in meaningful thinking for about 1% of the time that they're sitting in our lectures. Wow. I think it's not true. In our accounting class, we are 100% on it. Okay. On time. Good. We'll, yeah. we'll take your questions at the end. So this is just referring to one particular study that was done in the 1950s, okay? And you're certainly welcome to challenge it. So what did Bloom find? He found that 21% of the time, most people's minds are wondering during a lecture. I don't know, anecdotally, if I'm to look at my own experience, I don't really feel like that number is off too much. Maybe that means that 21% of you are out there um, daydreaming right now, and it's okay if you are. 78% of the time, students' thinking is either superficially related to the topic at hand, so meaning, they're thinking about it, but not in a deep and meaningful way. Or their thinking is totally irrelevant. So they're thinking about the teacher's mannerisms, the teacher's outfit. They're thinking about what they had for breakfast that day, whether or not they're going to go to the gym and meet their friend after class, things that are totally irrelevant, right? And I think it's really tempting for someone to come along and say, well, students must just be lazy. And it's probably the case that they're just not bringing their engaged brains to class. And if they would just do that, then they could really take away a lot from my lectures. I don't think that's true. I think our students are pretty motivated for the most part. I think that we evolve to want to learn and that that's true for everybody. And so students don't come to the class thinking, I'm here to try intentionally not to learn. I think it's more likely the case that lectures don't attend to the way that our brains actually do learning. And I'm just going to give you two short examples of this. So one has to do with multitasking. Uh, it used to be that multitasking was viewed as a highly desirable skill. You would see it um, in job ads. You know, we want somebody who can multitask, and people would say, I'm a great multitasker, right? But now research has shown that multitasking is actually a fallacy. Our brains were not built to actually multitask. It results in a ton of errors and problems when we try to multitask. It's not a desirable thing at all. So when our students are sitting in our class and we're lecturing at them, Lots of times, they're trying to do one thing with that lecture, right? So they may be transcribing. They may be trying to write down everything that it is that we're saying. If they're transcribing, they can't be listening. They can't be formulating higher order thinking skills. They can't be coming up with great questions. Or they may be trying to listen, which means they can't take notes, and they can't do those higher order thinking skills either, right? So we've created a situation where our expectations are up here, and the brain just can't meet those expectations. The other thing I'll mention is daydreaming. I think that we all sort of laugh when we think about daydreaming students as if they're doing something wrong. But what neuroscientists are finding today is that daydreaming is a natural state that our brain needs to enter into several times a day. And so when we're focused on something, like a lecture in statistics class, we are tightly focused on that information. But our brain cannot remain in that tightly focused state for long. It has to enter into what is called the diffuse state in order to process that information and in order to start making creative connections about things. 
things. So daydreaming actually happens for a very good reason. None of you should feel ashamed, even if you're daydreaming right now. It's okay. It's something our brains have to do, okay? And so keeping in mind that multitasking is a fallacy, that daydreaming has to happen, probably for 30%, 25% of your lecture, is it really the most useful way to engage students in learning? So what can we do differently to really help our students learn? For me, it always comes back to this quote by a man named Terry Doyle. He's written a couple of great books, and he says the person who does the work does the learning. Is oh, that the president. seriously a fire drill? No, no, it's no. from the president. Oh, from the president. like of the United yeah. States? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to be kidding me. It's our new national isn't like every moment an emergency in this country right now? Anyway, sorry. Um, okay. Um, okay, I can ignore it. Okay, so for me, no emergency. We're still just going to talk about learning. So for me, it comes down to this quote, the person who does the learning, work does the learning. And we all know this is true. If you're not willing to engage in something, you can't learn it. My husband, if he explains to me 100 times how to change the tire on a car, I'm not going to be able to really do it until I get down under the car and try to tinker with it myself. And he can be there guiding me, but I have to be willing to engage in the work. You don't get under the car. This you seems get like, oh, you don't get under the car. <laughs> See, I have no clue. I've never done it. So clearly, I haven't learned how to change a tire. So, um, yeah, I just really outed myself there. But anyways, the person who does the work does the learning. It's a super obvious thing, and yet it's also not. And here's what Donald Bly had to say about this way back in 1971 when he wrote a really popular book called What's the Use of Lectures. He said, you might think this principle is obvious, and so it is to ordinary people, but it's quite beyond some of the most intelligent people our educational system has produced. They want their students to do well on examinations, but they never give them practice in doing them. They want their students to use the library effectively, and they lecture to students as they show them around, but they don't design practice exercises in using it. Verbal presentations present words, and words are what students get from them. If you want students to be able to do something, put them in a situation where they practice doing it. I'll just read that last sentence again. If you want students to be able to do something, put them in a situation where they practice doing it. So here's a situation I want to share with you. This is my nine-year-old. Her name is Kaylin. She just got a new alarm clock a few weeks ago. She was super excited about this because she's a very mechanically-minded kid, and she loves do pressing buttons and trying to figure things out. And so we were sitting on her bed. <clears throat> she was trying to set her alarm, and she was having a whole lot of fun pressing these buttons. And after about five minutes of this, I started to get a little frustrated because I thought, it's bedtime. We really need to set this alarm and go to bed. Okay, I'm tired. You're tired. Let's, let's, get, over. let's get this over with. And so I said to her, this is how you do it. And she said, Mom, just leave me alone. I'm figuring it out. And I said, OK, we need to go to bed. So I took the alarm clock out of her hands. And I said, I've set a million alarm clocks. This is only going to take me two seconds. Just let me do it. So I started setting it. And she grabbed it back from me. And she said, Mom, stop it. If you really want me to learn how to do this, then I need to do it myself. I felt like I was hearing like my own echo chamber there, right? <laughs> and I was really annoyed because she was right. And because she's nine, and so I huffed it out of her room, and I said, fine. And I didn't come in later that night to see if it actually was set properly. I just thought, let's see what happens. So what do you think happened? She didn't, actually. She didn't set it right at all. It totally did not go off. And so I was so happy for a moment. I was like, point mom, you know? I was like, I. So I wanted to bust into her room and be like, I told you, you should have let me set that alarm clock, right? But that's horrible parenting. And I also really wanted to help her through the situation. So I went in and sat down with her. And I said, what happened? And we looked over the alarm clock. And she said, oh, there's a button on the back. And I see you have to kind of push it up into the on position. She had done everything else correctly. She had found the right numbers. She had stopped on them. Um, but she didn't put the button in the right position. So she said, well, I'll do that tonight. And it really led to a neat conversation because where she didn't want to hear what I had to say the night before, now she was full of questions for me. So she was like, well, what is AM and PM? And what do they mean? And like, what happens when we do uh, daylight savings time? Like, what am I gonna, how am I going to set my alarm clock then? And we got to have this really cool conversation about time and setting alarm clocks and stuff like that. And it was on her terms. And she got to enjoy uh, figuring it out. So the next day, what do you think happened? She did it right. It went off. The alarm went off, yeah. So through this experience, I was um, reminded of something that I have to keep learning over and over again. And that is that this is exactly the kind of process that we ought to be mimicking in our own classrooms because the person who does the work does the learning. And so I've had to start asking myself, 
what do I want my students to struggle with? What can I give them and step back from? How can I let them work with it for a little while? And if they run into questions or failures, how do I intervene at the right time to give them the formative feedback that they need to continue the struggle and to eventually experience the empowerment of doing it themselves, right? For years as a teacher, this was the question that guided my practice for many, many years. What do I need to cover or get through or talk about today? Because as teachers, we all have a heck of a lot of content, a certain number of chapters, stuff that we are told we have to get through or that we think we have to get through. Um, but I've gotten rid of that question, and now I don't ask it anymore. Now I ask, what do my students need to practice today to meet the desired outcomes, and how can I design a lesson that requires them to practice it? And this was the question that I kept in mind last spring when I designed my English 121 class completely over again just got rid of everything I was doing before and started from the ground up. And what I decided I wanted my students to do was to write a TED Talk, like we're doing here today, what matters to me, to write a TED Talk about something that really matters to them and to learn the skills involved with the class through that process. And so I'm not gonna read through these, I would bore you to tears, but I just included some of the things that we had the opportunity to practice um, because it just shows the the breadth of stuff that students got to actually do in class. And you're all in for a treat because today I actually have two of those students with me from last semester and they're gonna give their TED Talk for you that they did for the class and so, so cool. All right, so my final challenge, I'm gonna end here, my challenge to you is this. If you're faculty, um, you might challenge yourself by asking, not just what do I need to get through or what do I need to cover, but what do I want my students to do well and where do I let them practice this in my class? If you're students, maybe you can start to ask your professors about this. You might say something like, hey, I know we're gonna cover a lot of great information and content in this class, but what are we gonna have the opportunity to practice? What outcomes or skills am I gonna be able to gain proficiency at through this class? And if you're staff or somebody else, you can be part of the conversation too. You can ask faculty, what are students working on in your class? Not what are you covering, but what are students working on in your class? And you can ask students, what are you working on in your class? Because I think that if we really wanna make that shift from helping students be more than just students, sitting there with those glazed expressions on their faces, and we want them to actively move into the role of learner, then we're gonna to have to start questioning assumptions about how our brains learn, and we're gonna to have to start changing the conversation and I think that's something that we can all be a part of. Thank you. So I'm sure all of you here are aware of road rage. I'm sure you've encountered it in one way or another. You may even have road rage yourself. Well, to me, road rage is a clear example of people at their worst. It's sort of this phenomena of a possession, right? Like they've been taken over, like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation. I would categorize this behavior as unconscious. And what I mean by that is the person is no longer in control. It's purely emotional and reactionary. And the longer that someone is in this state of unconsciousness, the more a bad idea seems like a good one. For example, someone cuts you off in traffic, so you speed around to get in front of them or to just to get a look at them or flip them off. Or someone's riding too close behind you, so you brake check them. Well, these are dangerous actions, and for what? Today I'm going to talk to you about mindfulness meditation and how through the practice of mindfulness, you can not only spend less time in these ugly states of mind, but be more deliberate in your actions. So you may ask, why do we have these states of unconsciousness? And I would say it's just part of the human experience. But for example, I will use what life is like today in America in the 21st century. So we have, there's advertising, which is on every platform. It's on social media, TV, um, the radio, 
full of subtle messages that you're not good enough, um, pressuring you to buy things you don't need. And then there's the news, which is tragedy after tragedy. And then on top of all that, we have work and school. Some of us have kids to raise. You have errands to run, chores around the house, meals to fix, friendships and relationships to maintain. And at every moment, your mind is processing, thinking, narrating, judging, labeling. And you kind of get stuck in routine. And you start operating on autopilot, unaware the impact that all of these stressors have on you until it boils up and explodes out of you in something like road rage. Well, this is where mindfulness comes in. So mindfulness is simply a state of non-judgmental, non-discursive attention to the contents of consciousness, whether pleasant or unpleasant. The process of meditation is easy to describe. You close your eyes, get comfortable, and you focus on the breath. There's a rhythm to the breath. Where do you feel your breath? Is it in your stomach, in your chest? There's a sound to your breath. And the reason you focus on these physical sensations is because it allows you to get out of your head. It's a window into the present moment. So, I am going to have all of you meditate for two minutes right now. So focus on your breath, starting now. Okay, so I imagine that some of you, if not all of you, noticed maybe there was a lot of thinking going on. Some of you may have been thinking, oh, this is really stupid or embarrassing or can't wait till the speech is over. But the problem is not thoughts themselves. The problem is thinking being in a state of thinking without knowing that one is thinking. So, when you sit down to meditate, this is time to create space, to recharge, check in with yourself, decompress, and allow the subconscious to arise. You're not 
actively thinking or following thoughts or guiding thoughts. You're simply, simply being a witness to those thoughts. You're acknowledging those thoughts to observe them without judgment, to create detachment and gain insight into them. So you may discover that you have bottled feelings of anger or sadness, or maybe you're holding on to something you need to let go. Or the more you practice, you might realize that you have lots of states of thinking of complaining or judgment. So what mindfulness can do is help you wake up to the thoughts that have become habitual, like worrying about the future or dwelling on the past. And this is really important because you can't make changes to things that you weren't aware of. And you can't fix things when you didn't know what caused them. So, a brief history, mindfulness has been around for thousands of years. Started in Eastern culture and was brought over to the West in the 1960s by a man named John Kabat-Zinn, who is an internationally known scientist. He has a PhD from MIT and a Nobel laureate in medicine and physiology. He created the mindfulness-based stress reduction program in the 1970s, and since then, a lot of studies have been done on the how meditation improves things like mental health and memory, um, it reduces anxiety and depression, helps to resolve headaches and insomnia. However, little is known about the neural mechanisms associated with these improvements. So, a study was done by a team of Harvard Medical School doctors, and what they did was they took 16 meditation-naive participants, and they put them through an eight-week meditation program. And before that, they took MRI brain scans, and they took scans of the brain after the eight weeks. And what they found was an increase in gray matter density in specific areas of the brain. Now it has been established that an increase in gray matter density corresponds to improved functioning of the relevant areas of the brain. The areas of the brain that they found an increase in gray matter density were responsible for the regulation of emotion, introspection and awareness, empathy, sensory perception, coordination, and motor control. In contrast with these increases, it has been established that a decrease, um, so several pathological disorders like depression and PTSD are associated with a decrease in gray matter density in the hippocampus. And they found that during, during this eight weeks, there was an increase in gray matter density in the hippocampus, which means that it resolves or completely wipes out these disorders. So I also challenge you. I challenge you to notice, to see if you notice yourself getting angry. See if you notice yourself complaining or casting judgment on others. Take pause, step back, and see if you can see the bigger picture. You might notice that it's not worth your health or time to be in that current state of mind. And with the use of mindfulness meditation, not only can you spend less time in these unconscious, ugly states of mind, but you can gain insight from them. You don't have to go anywhere or buy anything. All you have to do is sit and observe the contents of consciousness. Thank you. I'd like you all to look around you. How many people do you think are settling? Probably a hell of a lot. People settle into okay jobs, okay relationships, okay friends, and okay lives. Why? 
because OK is comfortable. OK pays the bills and provides a warm bed at night. Some people are fine with OK. And guess what? That's OK. But OK isn't thrilling. It isn't passion. It isn't life-changing or unforgettable. OK is not the reason that you risk absolutely everything you've got on the smallest chance that something absolutely amazing could happen. A friend of mine shared that anonymous quote with me when I decided to go back to school after 15 years of not being in school. And it really hit home with me. As you're about to see, uh, I am not generally a settler, and I encourage you not to be either. While I'm talking, I'd like you to think about a big decision that you have to make. It can be anything, small, huge, whatever, just a decision that you have to make. And then, I'd like you to think about this. Sometimes, your harder choice can be your better choice, even if it doesn't seem that way at the time. I'd like to start out by pointing out that my inclination for making seemingly enormous poor choices that always wind up turning out pretty okay in the end is due in large part to my being gifted with my mother's buoyantly optimistic and incredibly easygoing outlook on life. I have yet to meet someone who can out positive think my mother. <laughs> True story. No one in the town that I grew up in in Florida went out of state for college. Uh, I came from a very small town. Most of my graduating class barely made it out of high school. So when I decided in April of my senior year of high school to go out of state for college, my mother was, of course, elated. Never mind that I hadn't taken the SATs yet or looked at any other colleges or filled out any financial aid paperwork. I just went. It was great. <laughs> Um, but two weeks after graduation, off I went in my crappy old car with a couple of suitcases and a student loan and drove a thousand miles away from every single person that I knew. Looking back, I probably could have saved myself a couple of thousand dollars in tuition and two cross-country moves, but I might not have gotten a part-time job at a hair salon and thought, hey, I could do that. Just like anything else in life, decision making is something that requires lots and lots of practice. And some people just find it easier than others. We all know that person that just for the life of them cannot decide on something as simple as what they want to eat for supper. Sometimes it's just in a person's temperament to be more anxious or fearful when it's time to make a big choice. Other times, the person has felt the sting of a poor choice and is not in a hurry to repeat the experience. Whatever the case, the foundation for being a good decision maker starts young. As early as toddlerhood, children are able to start making limited decisions for themselves. As a parent, this process can be incredibly time consuming and sometimes frustrating. When you ask your toddler, do you wanna wear a red shirt today or a blue shirt? And they decide, really only the yellow shirt is happening today. But down the line, there's going to come a time when they have to make a bigger decision on their own, and you're not always going to be around to help them. No matter who you are, making big life choices can be pretty intimidating or emotionally charged. In an article published in Psychology Today, Dr. Sharam Hash Hashmat discusses a strategy for that people can employ in these types of situations called personal simulation, which is basically a fancy way of saying that you imagine the outcome of your options. For example, if you're choosing a house to buy, you would imagine yourself living in each of your choices. And one of them feels better to you, boom, your decision's made. Not hard, right? But sometimes you can't use this technique. Sometimes you don't have any experience in the thing that you're trying to decide. For example, someone trying to choose whether or not they want to have children if they've never really been around children. So, Dr. Hashmat suggests in situations like this, it's often helpful to reframe your choice. So instead of children or no children, your choice now becomes 
do I want the experience of raising children? This strategy does require a little bit of a leap of faith, and that can be very scary. A research paper published in the journal Emotion in 2010 has shown pretty conclusively that heightened emotions, particularly fear, can actually hinder your brain's ability to make decisions. So it's important, especially with big decisions or emotionally charged decisions, to take a step back and look at things from a non-emotional perspective. Another issue that can throw a big wrench in your decision-making process is that oftentimes your choices are on par with one another. There is no right choice. Both of your choices are equally as good. So now what? What do you do? For example, let's say you're me and you're choosing whether you want to stay in college and become an engineer or drop out and go to beauty school. I know these don't seem on par, but they totally are. Either way, I could wind up with a happy, successful, well-paying career. At the end of the day, it really comes down to what's going to make you the happiest. As Dr. Ruth Chang says in her TED Talk about the philosophy of making difficult choices, our response to hard decisions is not dictated by reasons given to us, but rather supported by reasons given by us. And when we create reasons for ourselves to become this kind of person rather than that, we wholeheartedly become the people that we are. Ultimately, you and no one else is in charge of what your life turns out like. So take the time to think about what's going to be your right choice and not someone else's. Skipping forward in my personal decision-making journey a few years, I have, against all odds, and my family and friends' disbelief, successfully navigated quitting college to go to beauty school, moving across the country to Philadelphia, where I knew exactly one person, moving across the country again to Colorado, where I knew exactly zero people, and I finally settled into a well-paying job at the salon of my choice. So, when a girl I worked with asked me if I wanted to quit said well-paying job and go out on our own, I obviously said yes immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I found myself being a small business owner before I turned 30. Okay, so, You've tried all of my advice so far. You've taken a step back emotionally. You've reframed your choice. You've considered what will make you happy. And you're still stuck. Not to worry. There are still a few more things that we can try. Have you ever heard the advice, flip a coin? And if you're disappointed with the result you got, you really wanted the other choice? This is actually a simplified version of another decision-making strategy offered by Dr. Alan Hendrickson in an article published in Scientific American. Let's say you're offered two jobs and you can't decide between them. Pretend that job A is suddenly off the table. How do you feel? Are you relieved? Are you disappointed? Do you not care? Now, do the same thing with job B. Chances are, that if you're really being honest with, your, with yourself, you'll know which job is the one that you really want. Another strategy Dr. Hendrickson suggests is to try and take yourself out of the equation altogether. Pretend a friend came to you with the same situation. What advice would you give to them? Another thing to keep in mind is you are not alone. So reach out to a friend or a family member, a teacher, someone who you think is a good decision maker. Sometimes all you need to do is talk things over out loud to gain the perspective that's been eluding you. So, back to the whole salon owning thing. It turns out that no matter how much you love doing something, doing it 24-7, all the time, every day, gets really old, really fast. Really, when people hit you up at 1 o'clock in the morning for a nail appointment. So. I decided to sell my half of the salon to my business partner, and I spent last summer figuring out what I wanted to do when I grow up. Then, one day it hit me. I wanted to be a nurse. That night, literally that night, I applied for Front Range. 
I filled out my FAFSA online. The next day I came in and I took my placement test. And the rest is history. Here we are. I'd like you to go back to the choice that I asked you to think about at the beginning. Try some of the things that we talked about. And I bet you'll have it figured out in no time. Never be afraid to make a seemingly difficult choice. Because you never know where you might wind up. I'd like to leave you with a quote from one of my favorite authors that I think sums things up much more nicely than I ever could. I begin to see how important it is to be an enthusiast in life. If you are interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it full speed, embrace it with both arms, hug it, love it, and above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. Thank you. I understand Jeff had to go to work, Yes. but uh, Carrie and Katie are now available for your questions and conversation. Mm -hmm. Please, awkward face. <laughs> <laughs> Do we make it out? Oh, there Sorry. we go. Uh, did you have any experience in making one of the Um, So, quite a few of my really good friends are nurses, and my grandma has also been a nurse for 50 years, um, and I've always been interested in like medical things and so it was kind of a natural extension of like caring for people just in a different kind of way. What made you choose Colorado? Um actually so when we moved to Colorado I had never been here before ever um, and when I got to Port Collins I was kind of a little bit shocked that it didn't look like Colorado does in the movies. <laughs> there was no, it was, it was August, it was hot, it was very flat, so, um, but just because it was somewhere that I had never been before, just a new adventure, I guess. Yeah. Terry, I wonder if you can give an example of class structure that was formerly lecture-based, or an activity that was lecture-based that you transformed yeah. into practice. Because that's what I was sort of thinking of. S sometimes you hit this roadblock, and, yeah. and you have to really work at it to transform it to actual experiential. Yeah, that's a great question. And don't get me wrong, I actually love to lecture. I'm really into myself, and I feel like you know, <laughs> the more I can talk, the better. So, um, so this has been really hard for me. Because um, in my pa in the past, it was always like, if I could just make this clear enough, if I could just say it well enough, then I will save my students the struggle of them having to work through it themselves. But I've since learned that's not the right approach. Anyway, so I'll give you an example. Um, this just maybe happened a week ago, and I have some students here that can probably attest to this. So I had a PowerPoint that I created on um, research and why research is important and how to do research well. and. I was really proud of that PowerPoint. You know, it probably took me an hour or two to create. I thought it was really good. And I was looking it over the night before, the morning before class, and I just, a year after creating it, and I thought, this is so boring. Like, I am bored reading my own PowerPoint, and so how can I expect my students to enjoy this? So as I was walking to class, I just had this honest conversation with myself where I said, well, why do I need to do this PowerPoint? What do I want them to get from it? And I realized that all the information that I packed into that PowerPoint actually boiled down to three questions. And so rather than doing the PowerPoint, I came into class and I said, I have a really boring PowerPoint. I've just thrown it out. We're going to do this instead. And so I asked them to answer these three questions um, through writing and then to get together with a partner and talk through their answers and then to share out with the class. And this is a very common technique called think-pair-share that educators use. And so rather than me just delivering that content to them, I asked them to generate it. And then once they had all of the answers to those questions, we put them all up on the board. And I stood back from that and I looked at it and I thought that is everything that was in my lecture right there. My students were able to generate it even better than I could have done it. And so it's just, I have so many of those stories, um, but I still need to be reminded all the time. That's great. Sherry. I have one and I'm not gonna put myself on camera. So. But, um, um, so I, I worked in a middle school as a special ed para before I took the leap and quit my day job and became a full-time freelancer and filmmaker. And um, 
one trend that I was seeing, and, and uh, this was in a science class I was at, would, would be teachers who would um, have the students watch a film, and as a filmmaker I was appalled by this when I saw it, and also have laptops and engage in an online discussion with each other and take notes all at the same time they were watching the film. And I watched the students be like so involved in the discussion and giggling and like not engaged at all in the film. The teacher would throw out questions during the film that they had to respond to in this discussion and I thought, how could they possibly get anything out of this film? Um, and so I'm just wondering like, and this is not that long ago and it, it's a trend that I was seeing more and more. So. Is, do you see that happening in schools, or are we, was it like a blip, and, and are we looking at the studies on multitasking and how those mm -hmm. things don't work for learning, but yeah. That's an interesting question. I haven't witnessed a lot, I mean, it sounds like what you are talking about is almost the opposite of lecture. It's like where all of these things are happening at once, and students are being forced to choose like what they want to plug into, knowing that they're missing out on other things if they choose. And so, I mean, that seems equally problematic to me. I think more common to what I see is just the three hour lecture with 72 PowerPoint slides and then a giant exam five times a semester that tries to determine whether or not you've crammed all that information into your head or not. Yeah, I think what they're trying to do is active learning. Yeah. Like they're trying to get students engaged, mm -hmm. but. Too many things going on at yeah. once though. Yeah. So you worked at CSU, were you an instructor there? Mm -hmm. How would you implement this mm -hmm. type of thing in a, in a classroom of 300 people? Yeah, or even that's online? a really good question. So you're right, at Front Range it's one thing because we have really great intimate classes Which of 24 is, yeah. students. Okay, for us, at CSU, I was a writing teacher so I still had small classes, but there are like psychology classes or philosophy classes in lecture halls with 350 students. Yeah. And so what does this model look like? Can you help me out, Eric? Who is the name of the physics teacher? Um, if you email me, I can send it to you. There's a really famous example of a physics teacher who did teach in lecture halls and might have been at Harvard or something like that. And he kind of had this realization with his own teaching and he turned his lecture hall into an active learning place. And so because I don't deal with those large lectures myself, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at how to do that. But I know it's possible, and I know that there's this one guy, physics, right, Eric, physics teacher, um, who's done a really nice job with it. And he's a leading person in STEM now. Okay. And so if you just send me an email, I can send you. How, how do you do that online, though? Oh, yeah. I mean, don't even get me started, right? So online is really where um, my colleague Eric and I discovered this. Okay. Because we took a class that we had taught face-to-face and that we really prided ourselves in saying a lot of great things in. And then we went online and we didn't have our lectures. And our students actually did way better in our online classes. Awesome. Because we forced them to do the stuff that we were just talking to them about in our face-to-face -face classes. And so that was the wake-up moment for me and for Eric and why we got interested in this stuff. Can I do a follow-up question on that sure. really quick? Um, what gives you job security after implementing something like that? Ooh. Because mean people like that are going to come along and... Like, mean people I, like me about what they do. Oh, right. Well, you know, I think it's really good because we need evaluation and yeah, yeah. correction as well. Yeah. But what's going to lead to us yeah. having correction and evaluation outside of a human being? Oh, I see what you mean. Like, do you mean are we going to be replaced you're with models? Be out, you're going to be outsourced. Yeah. Okay. It, I know. No. I hope not. So another really fantastic study that I just read about talked about a school in Florida that basically had too large of a program and they decided to use active learning modules to solve the problem. And so they got rid of the, they didn't get rid of the teachers, but they had the teachers not teach, not do lecture halls anymore. And instead all the students in the business program are doing these modules on their own and coming to class three times a semester to see their teachers. The modules are great, students hate them. Yeah, they I, hate it. I'm click, 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 click. They hate it because they feel like it's inauthentic and they lost that connection with the teacher. So I don't think this is a model that's going to eliminate teachers at all. So. No, no. Because they're trying it without teachers and it's failing miserably. So I hate to interrupt. Well, thank you again to Carrie and to Katie. And I'd like to let you know that we have two more What Matters to Me this fall on November 1st and November 29th. So if you enjoy today, please feel free to come and tell your friends and colleagues to come and participate with what we're going to do. And I understand that we will have veterans 
um, speaking to us about their experiences at the next session. So that should prove very interesting. Thank you all for coming today. All right.